And then the final of our speakers this morning is Ari Gesha, a senior engineer with Palantir Technologies, who will give another interesting perspective on the limitations of automated decision making and what Palantir's approach to mining human computer symbiosis might be. Ari. Uh, good morning. I want to talk to you today about a, a subject, a, a design principle that's sort of near and dear to my heart, and that is human-computer symbiosis, building systems that use humans and computers together to come up with uh, better performance, better results than you could do using either one in isolation. And the place where I want to start this story is actually uh, in 1997, when Kasparov loses to Deep Blue. In computer science circles, it used to be a really fun sport to try to build computers to beat humans at chess, and then one day, the computer wins, and they say, wow, we need to come up with a new sport. And so uh, what follows is this notion of something called freestyle chess, right? And in a freestyle chess tournament, there are no rules about how you come up with the moves, no rules with how you put together a team to decide how to play the game. So you can put together a team of psychics, uh, but maybe more pragmatically, you can put together a team of humans and computers working in concert. And in one of these um, tournaments, uh, a very powerful computer, more powerful than Deep Blue, named Hydra was entered. Uh, you know, the designers wanted to see how it would do. And uh, what happened was that it was actually knocked out of the tournament pretty early. It did well against some opponents, but uh, a grandmaster using uh, a laptop and some commodity chess hardware or chess software uh, was able to actually beat this very, very powerful computer. So a very strong human using a relatively weak computer was able to beat a very, very strong computer. This was not the surprising part of the tournament. What was surprising was actually who won. And the team that won was a team of two amateurs, so kind of humans that were actually fairly weak at chess but understood the game pretty well, using four different chess programs on three different pieces of commodity hardware with some glue code that they had written to tie it all together. So these were people who knew a lot about the problem. They knew what questions to ask. And most importantly, they knew how to efficiently offload the work that they needed the computers to do to the computers. And they handily won the tournament, beating the Grandmaster. So I want to go even further back in time now, right, to um, an idea that actually started kind of around here, um, th this notion of AI. So in, in 1957 at the Dartmouth con uh, conference, uh, the, the idea of building thinking machines is dubbed artificial intelligence. And it, it becomes a, a holy grail of the field for what has been now about 60 years. Um, and as you know, we still don't quite have thinking machines. And the field of AI, though, has produced some, some amazing techniques and results that we use today. And they make up a lot of what we would call sort of our big data workflows. Um, but if we go back to those early days of computing, uh, there were two people that I want to pick out specifically. Vannevar Bush, who oversaw um, the Manhattan Project during the war. He ran something called NACA, which later became NASA. He oversaw the organization that became the NSF. Uh, and on the right, Jared Licklider, uh, who ran Project Mac here at, at MIT. He's known as sort of the Johnny Appleseed of CS, they both envisioned um, a, a whole different way of approaching this problem of using computers with something they called intelligence augmentation, right? And the idea with intelligence augmentation is rather than building a machine that does all the thinking for you, you sort of put data on one side, you get an answer out the other end, is to figure out how to build these systems that are a cooperation between the strengths of humans and the strengths of computers, right? Um, and fast forward to the modern day, I work at a company, Palantir Technologies. What we do is we build software that embodies this design vision. We build big stacks of data analysis software that actually keep a human in the loop to do decision making on some of the more complex in the world to problems in the world today. So uh, to a user, uh, this is like a static screenshot of what an analysis environment looks like. They're actually very interactive. Um, from uh, we, we call what it's built on top of data fusion platforms, right? It's the idea of bringing together all the different data that you have about a problem and transforming it into a model that maps well to the way that people think about a problem. Um, Conceptually, our object models look something like this. Don't worry, there, there won't be a quiz on this. Um, and you know, from a network perspective, it's sort of your modern cloud computing large cluster paradigm. Right? Um, but we use this to actually solve some problems in the world that you can't solve in any other way. Um, so 
Hurricane Sandy, which actually was, was mentioned earlier, was actually one of these places. So the problem of disaster recovery, what do you do after the hurricane hits? How do you put things back together? It's a very messy and complex problem and not one that actually yields to automation very easily. Um, we deployed into Rockaway Beach, which is actually one of the hardest hit parts uh, of New York in Hurricane Sandy with an organization called Team Rubicon, which is a veterans volunteer organization uh, to help them with their recovery efforts. And, and this is sort of how it went. Palantir Technologies is a software company based in Palo Alto. We've come to help out with Hurricane Sandy, this organization called Team Rubicon, which is a group of veterans that provides disaster relief. The problem that Team Rubicon faces is there's a lot of people here in the Rockaways that need help. They need to identify those people, transfer that information to a centralized location very quickly, and then dispatch teams to go help those people and clean up their houses, essentially. When we first got here, Team Rubicon was recording their data on paper. The first thing we did is we ate all that information. Then we set up a system where residents are just walking up, there's a volunteer standing there with an iPad, putting their information into a web form that automatically creates an object in Palantir that is a request for help object. We're actually going to be looking for more of this while we're up here. The other primary way is we've got people with Palantir mobile devices, and they go out, they take photos of the damage itself, and they send that image and that data, and it creates an object in Palantir out of that. With that data, we use it as efficiently as we can, dispatch the work teams out to these sites. How many work orders did you guys get? We send computer scientists into the field. We showed up here and Palantir wasn't configured for this setting. We built it on the spot. We built the web flow in place. We built the ontology in place. We trained all of the volunteers here so that they knew how to use it. And five or six days later, they're doing disaster relief in a way that nobody ever has before. Palantir was founded with the motto that they were gonna go out and solve really hard problems. Helping people in a disaster is one of the world's hardest problems. So my colleague, Brian Fishman, isn't underestimating just how hard disaster relief is, right? It's, it's actually one of the more, more uh, difficult problems in the world because you actually don't know what the problem is until this sort of this instantaneous event of the hurricane coming through or the tornado coming through, the earthquake happening, uh, occurring happens. And so at the end of the day, it ends up being a problem around resource allocation, right? You, you often have a race against time. In Sandy, it's about getting water out of homes before mold takes over the structures. Uh, if you can, if you can uh, muck it out and replace some drywall, it's a $5,000 problem. If you wait too long, you actually have to tear down the whole house and replace it, right? Um, so, uh, but it, there's so many different variables and difficulties that go into this that building an automated system for this is nearly impossible. So the first is this sort of fog of war problem, right? You actually don't, like, all of your communication systems have been knocked out. You don't even know what's broken yet. Um, you have issues of triage, figuring out once you even know what's broken, how exactly to effectively dispatch the resources that you have. Um, you can run into problems of catastrophic success, which we almost, we were able to, to deal with. Uh, the Clinton Global Initiative showed up with, uh, on a day with a thousand volunteers. They said, we're here for one day, we're here to help, what can we do, right? And if you can't actually very efficiently break up your work orders and send them out uh, into, into small teams to actually do that work, those resources are actually, they're effectively lost. Um, data security is also a very important part of this, where you need to, uh, these, populations become very vulnerable. And there, there's, pre there's actually predatory contractors that show up in disaster zones saying, well, FEMA will pay for this later, but if you give me $5,000 now, I'll fix your house today. Um, and the situation is emerging. It's actually changing and can change radically sort of overnight. In, in Sandy, a week later, there was a blizzard, which actually changed the conditions of recovery. Uh, in the more Oklahoma tornadoes, there was another set of tornadoes that came through a few days later. Um, so it's, it's sort of one of the more complex problems on Earth. And what you, in, computers can help, but you actually need humans in the loop to do decision making. So this is sort of, uh, this is a map of Rockaway. You can actually see all the different work orders they put together. There's videos of this stuff online if you want to go see how the analytic work environments actually work. But I want to sort of switch streams now to places where humans and computers and automation can actually work together very, very strongly. So we've heard a lot about um, automated decision making. 
and, and the ability to sort of put together algorithms that can figure out, uh, you know, whether or not someone's pregnant, whether or not to target ads to them, and that's great. Um, and you can do amazing things with data. But the place where these things break down is when you have an adaptive adversary, when you actually have people on the other side actively trying to evade detection and change what it is that you're trying to figure out, change the, the rules of that data, right? And so why is this? Well, if we go back to sort of everything that machine learning has brought us, uh, what we have is this incredible library of statistical methods that can look at some set of data about the past, characterize it and classify it, and then use it to make predictions about the future as new data comes in. And that works great as long as the data isn't changing, right? And so there's a whole host of modern problems that actually have this adaptive adversary in the mix. And for there, the, the sort of the algorithmic decision making that big data puts out as a promise fails, right? So very simple ones are things like spam email, right? Um, uh, Anti-fraud issues, right? Fraud is like this, I didn't realize this until we got into this business. Fraud is huge. It's everything from online bank accounts to credit cards to um, generic medications. Fraud is sort of everywhere, and it's sort of a classic adaptive adversary problem. Um, cybersecurity is another one that's sort of blooming. They even have their own terms for it in cybersecurity. APT, advanced persistent threat, people who are trying to sneak in past your defenses. Um, and uh, in the financial world, you have things like rogue traders, people who are, who are making trades like the London whale trade, um, or who are exfiltrating data, doing things like insider trading. And no um, discussion of adaptive adversaries would be complete without talking about counterterrorism. Right? Today, I want to focus on a single problem, and that's actually in the realm of fraud, and it's something called credit card bust out. So credit card companies actually use automation and automated fraud models very, very successfully. You've probably gotten a call from them before where they say, hey, did you use your card in Barcelona? And you're like, no, I haven't been to Barcelona this year. Um, and they say, great, we'll send you a new card. And that's really great for spotting simple anomalies. But, but bust out is actually a much more complex fraud. So here's a, here's a recipe if you want to start your own bust out ring. Um, Really simple. First thing, you come up with um, a bunch of fake identities. You use those to open up credit card accounts. Um, then you actually use those accounts. You go out and buy things on those accounts, and you pay off the bill, right? And what happens is, over time, those credit lines go up. Um, you hit some magic number where you say, this is it. This is my cash out number. And then you max out all the cards in one day. Then you write, and this, this is actually my favorite part, you write fake checks to zero out the balances. And what happens is the balance goes to zero before the check's clear. So then you max out the cards a second time. Um, then you disappear. Um, and if, you're, you know, if this is a career that you're making yourself, actually what you do is you start over and make up new accounts uh, under new fake identities and sort of start the whole process over again. So this is really, really hard to spot with automation. Um, and, it, and making this final determination, because this all looks like legitimate transactions, um, is something that a machine can't really do. So what we do is we actually put together a system where we use sort of simple clustering that looks at things like uh, the account details, uh, transaction, uh, the transaction details about where and when the card is being used, the payment details about how the card is being paid, communications information about who's calling the bank, what the caller ID information is on that, uh, IP address and, and cookie information, to put together sets of accounts that shouldn't be related to each other, but are in some way. And then those clusters are scored by the aggregate credit risk across all those accounts, and then they're queued up for human analysis. And a human analyst will get something in an interactive environment like this, and they have to go and tease apart whether or not it's fraud. Um, and you run into big false positives. They had a huge furball of a $20 million cluster. And they said, oh my, this is the mother load. Uh, and they went and looked at it. It turns out there was a single linking parameter, which was a phone number. And that phone number corresponded to a very large organization that had something like 100,000 employees. That was the outgoing caller ID for every call made from the office, right? And that had linked those accounts together. Um, and so the, the, the sort of the takeaway here is that, that for these kinds of very complex problems, the only way to solve this is by using the humans uh, in concert um, with the computers. And the important thing is when you bring the humans into the mix, they need to, to have a situation that's very low friction. They need to be able to interact with the data very richly and very interactively. So I want to send you home with a recipe of sort of the three things that you need to have inside these interactive analysis environments, right? So um, the first uh, is that the interface has to be familiar. It has to actually speak to the user in a way that they understand. You can't give them something in terms of data storage primitives and tables and rows and fields and columns and data types. It actually has to use their mental language about how they, how they think about the problem. The second is that it has to be interactive. This kind of analysis is incredibly complex. You actually don't know all the questions you're going to ask. And in fact, you, it has to support ad hoc analysis. And so if you have to wait 
12 hours or ask a person and wait for them to make you a report uh, between answering questions, uh, it's a problem. We're, our baseline is about 10 seconds between questions, right? Um, and finally, it has to be expressive, right? So I can say, show me all the houses that need work orders within two miles uh, that have been recorded in the past day. That's an easy thing for me to formulate. But if I have to actually input a, a sequence of 120 commands to the computer to get that done, that's onerous, it's error prone, it's slow. Um, expressivity ends up being a proxy for efficiency, right? Um, and if you have those th three things together, you can actually solve problems that can't be solved in any other way. And so the way that we think about it at the end of the day is you want to connect the people who care to the data that matters, that they need to actually do their job without friction. And then we sort of realize this vision of Vannevar Bush and Licklider about this intervening period before we build the thinking machines when the greatest advances are going to be built by humans and computers working together in concert. Thank you.